Okay, so give us a few seconds for uh, everybody to, jo to join us online. We're in the webinar on, really for me, it's an awesome topic. Uh, maybe you're not as excited about the topic, but I'm excited as soon as I saw the uh, article and the uh, title and the photos in the Smithsonian Magazine. Uh, I immediately reached out to Ismail, an old dear friend and colleagues from Northern California, that this is a topic that uh, we need to have a conversation about. And uh, he introduced me to Matt uh, as well to try to get uh, both of them because they both have worked uh, on the both articles that we will be discussing. And uh, this is just for us to introduce a topic. And earlier I was uh, saying that when you approach the topic of Sudan as a country, but also as a history, uh, you're almost always dealing with a threefold uh, uh, erasure or threefold uh, uh, um, removal of focus on uh, Sudan. One is that you have the uh, focus from European scholars on Egypt and trying to locate Egypt in the long history, not only sometimes of uh, North Africa, but also Sudan, and they might take it all the way down to wherever they can, looking and trying to get that lens. But the second is looking for Egypt in Sudan. And so Sudan does not get uh, really the focus that it needs. And then the third, also looking at Sudan from trying to locate Islam, Muslims, uh, Sudan in the regional conflict, uh, rather than actually approaching uh, Sudan's history, uh, which uh, 3,000 plus years, if not more, uh, that we know is documented. So it's a pleasure for me to have Ismail Kushkush with me uh, today. He's a journalist, wrote for New York Times, uh, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and now The Smithsonian Magazine, uh, and uh, really a dear friend from a long time ago. He's a graduate from UC Davis, uh, up the street from us in here. I knew him from the time during the work of the anti-apartheid movement, uh, in Northern California, so really a long history. And it's really a pleasure to be introduced to Matt Stern with us, uh, an archeologist and a photographer based between Jackson Hole and Boston. He's currently in Wyoming where they're expecting a, a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. So if he's get cut off from us, it's definitely by no means that we are censoring him <laughs> because we didn't like anything. It's because uh, the snow. So welcome, uh, and really it's a pleasure to have both of you uh, with me today. So the first question really, just to introduce maybe a short biography, what got you into this topic? I know Sudan, I know uh, Ismail, you have done some work, but what, what got you into this topic and how did you begin this research? I mean, for me, it, it, was, it was personal, um, trying to, um, you know, discover your roots, um, trying to understand your own history. Um, the history of ancient Sudan uh, or the kingdom of Kush or ancient Nubia uh, never was never taught in um, the curricula of, of any of the schools that I went to, uh, whether in the United States as a child or in the Middle Eastern countries that I lived in, uh, in Kuwait or in Syria. Um, as a child, that, that history was never taught. Um, I mean, I remember vividly in the fifth grade as a child uh, study, studying the history of uh, the ancient history of the region. Uh, we studied ancient Egypt, the Levant, Mesopotamia, Persia, Greece, Rome, but never of uh, that of ancient Sudan. So, um, I mean, I remember asking my father um, about that and, you know, gave me a brief uh, description that, you know, the country does have pyramids and, and you know, and ancient temples and so forth. But um, since the fifth grade at the age of 10, Every time that I was uh, on a summer vacation in Sudan, I would go to the National Museum, uh, collect as many as books as I could and, and read about it. Um, and, you know, and I studied history as an undergraduate student at UC Davis, and uh, I studied African and Middle Eastern history. Um, and, and that's what got me into it. My work as a journalist in Sudan, um, as a reporter for the New York Times, um, you know, gave me a chance to go to some of these ancient sites and uh, got, gave me a chance to, at times to write about it even. And Matt? Yeah, um, so my, my history as an archaeologist um, goes all the way to, back to when I was 13 years old. Um, but through, throughout my career of doing that and then 
and covering other people's work as a photographer, I've constantly been drawn to stories, as kind of Ishmael said, that that you feel the the entire story isn't being told. If if you if I have trouble researching it in a library or on the internet, I'm instantly fascinated that there is there's an untold narrative that exists that is worth exploring. Um, and in regards to Sudan, um, this actually was kind of serendipitous that a um, an old college roommate was working on the new visitor center at the Meroe Pyramids. Um, and, and I made that connection to go and I started to research a little bit what I could about Sudanese history, Sudanese archaeology, and that exact same thing happens that continues to draw me across the world in that I could only find fragmented information on it. Um, there, there really wasn't a lot out there. And, and oftentimes what I did find was almost entirely related to, to conflict or or very um, negative or difficult stories in Sudan. And like everywhere, that's not the only narrative that exists. And so I was absolutely fascinated. And so I, I spent a couple of years trying to put this project together and finally got to go this spring and, and pursue it and was delighted to find this, this amazing culture and amazing history that the, the world really should know about. And I that I just found myself kind of a little part to, to bring that to light. Great. So let's uh, go through maybe some of the chronology of history. I know that in your articles, uh, you say 3100 BC, approximately mm -hmm. the date. So take us, yeah, into so that, that, take us into that history and then we could go back sure. and forth between you and uh, Ismail on that. Okay. Um, well, actually, so looking in Sudanese history, what fascinates me most is going even further back to say 10,000 years ago. Um, and that was a a really fascinating time when the Sahara Desert wasn't quite formed yet and Sudan looked a lot like modern day Kenya or Tanzania. Um, there's actually a couple petroglyph sites, rock art drawn in Sudan along the Nile that has amazing panels of, of people hunting things like giraffes or elephants or hippos, things you don't associate with, uh, with the desert at all. But over time, um, by, by entirely natural causes, the, the desert began to form. And as a result, people began to, to congregate. And you kind of see that all over the world. As soon as a lot of times climate changes in, in one circumstance, people come together and um, an amazing change happens. And that's what we call the Neolithic period when mm -hmm. people settle down, they start farming and all of a sudden towns and then cities pop up. And in Sudan, that city was called Kerma. Um, and Kerma is located near the, the great bend of the Nile. And was the largest and earliest Bronze Age city outside of, um, in, in Africa, outside of Egypt. And what a lot of people didn't realize for, for quite a while was that it was entirely separate. Um, throughout its history, it, it began to have a long intertwining relationship with Egypt, but at its core, at its very beginning, it was an entirely African city. And well, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about this, but it took archeologists almost a, I mean, almost a decade to, to realize this. And, and um, that's basically that the, early uh, European uh, archeologists identified as an extension of Egypt. They did, yeah, rather exactly. Rather than they, having its own historical mm -hmm. development that is distinct and different uh, yep. from Egypt. Yeah, it was a group of American archeologists. And as, as you said, um, they went to Sudan looking for Egypt, not to Sudan looking for Sudan. And that's, that's unfortunately exactly what happened. And that they arrived there and they found these fascinating cities with pyramids, Bronze Age cities, and it did look similar to what they were finding in Egypt, but they were not prepared whatsoever at the time to acknowledge that it could have been somebody else. It could have been um, an actual um, African civilization that was, was separate. Um, and it was, wasn't until really the 1960s that a, a Swiss archaeologist, Charles Bonnet, did make that connection and entirely changed the entire world's view. Um, but to do a real quick history of Sudan, um, Kerma lasted a very, very long time, almost 1,500 years um, as a Bronze Age city, traded massively throughout the Middle East, Africa, and up, up, into, um, up into the Mediterranean as well. And then eventually Egypt did conquer Kerma. Um, there was a back and forth uh, conquest between the two, and mm -hmm. Kerma pushed into Egypt and back and forth, but eventually Kerma did, um, did succeed to Egypt. But uh, the people from Kerma moved south to um, another city, Napata. And that's where the kind of the, the real Kushite kingdom that um, is really being recognized in our Smithsonian article um, came to light. Yeah. And they I, continued. To... Oh, go for it. Ismail, I, I, I read your piece and you 
intersperse your piece with your personal narrative and how your visit to the pyramids uh, uh, in Sudan about 25 years and you thought that you were almost hugging them. So speak I, I and intertwine. I literally hugged the pyramid. Yeah. I, I literally in Sudan and again, not the ones in Egypt. <laughs> yes, yes, the one, I, I have a photo of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think on early Sudanese history, it's also important to recognize that, you know, this region um, of the Nile Valley, uh, which um, uh, the southern part of the Nile Valley, which is a part of the, you know, the Great Rift region, you know, early human um, presence uh, in East Africa that we know of, it, it, it's linked, it's close to what we, you know, the early findings that are in Ethiopia and Kenya, um, you know, what we call prehistory. Uh, mm -hmm. You find um, evidence of that in different parts of Sudan, even in places like Khartoum or Sindia, or the rock um, paintings in Arwenat in, in North uh, Western Sudan near the uh, Libyan Egyptian uh, border. But I mean, as men Matt was mentioning, I mean, Kerma uh, and its uh, predecessors, uh, what, what archaeologists have called the, you know, the A group and the C group, mm -hmm. uh, these are the very early um, civilizations that uh, in uh, of ancient Kush, of ancient Nubia, of what today is is what we know as Sudan, um, and um, it it goes through various developments, um, and in its time it was a rival to Egypt, um, even Kerma. I mean, we, we usually think of of, of the kings of Nepeta uh, conquering Egypt, but even Kerma itself uh, uh, went all the way to Thebes uh, and uh, almost uh, had an alliance with the Hyksos. Um, so I mean, the the early history of, of ancient Kush uh, parallels that of the old kingdom in Egypt and, and, and the middle kingdom. And, you know, um, that there is a history that, um, a, as you mentioned, um, that is often seen as uh, a part of Egyptian history, but in fact, it really was uh, an equal rival to, to ancient Egypt. And I like when the, the, your discussion about the Napta and the archaeological digs in there show that it was part of also a regional uh, of African and Central African influences that is distinctive than uh, the development that we see in Egypt. So either you or Matt can speak about that in terms of the distinctive features that we see in uh, the land of Kush in this sense. I think Matt's article goes uh, a lot into that. Uh... And be, if you want to share photographs, yeah. by all means, that, uh, and to speak about them, uh, I'll, I could turn the sharing because you asked uh, for that, so you could do that as well. Yeah, um, yeah I can always pull some together, but um, I think it, at Kerma in particular, you really do see um, a congregation of a lot of, of different African cultures, especially in the early years there. And the archaeologists are still trying to figure out where exactly they came from. Um, one of the biggest reasons is there's there's not a lot of parallels anywhere else to compare them to, um, and and the primary reason is because not a lot of archaeology has been done in, for example, in in Sudan south of Khartoum or into South Sudan or um, other countries surrounding. But what they did find is, as Ishmael mentioned, we've archaeologists give people cultures we don't know horrible names sometimes. And so we're calling them the A group, the B group, and the C group. <laughs> um, and that's what George Reisner in the early 1900s termed them and it, it stuck. Um, but what he's identified is that the, the types of artifacts that these cultures brought into Kerma correspond to what we see in places like Ethiopia and South Sudan and further into Africa. And they, they came from all over the place. And so you almost see Sudan as this kind of central point for all of these early African cultures coming together um, and, and evolving into this brilliant um, civilization. And it's, it's really neat to see. Right. I mean, I would add to that also, it's, a, it's a important to uh, understand that uh, the geography at the time was different from what it is today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, um, you know, one, one um, place that uh, I think uh, could possibly reveal um, much of, of that history uh, is a place like Wadi Hawar, uh, which is a dry valley um, coming all the way from Chad all the way to, to the Nile, uh, which many uh, believe um, in its time was a, uh, a river, a tribute uh, to, the, to the River Nile. Um, some 
even uh, call it the, the Yellow Nile. Uh, we know there is the Blue Nile, the White Nile, the River Nile, but this, this dry valley that comes all the way from Chad uh, into um, um, uh, near the town of Debba um, is, is, uh, is, is an area where I mean, it just shows you that the, the geography was different, that the migration um, was very, very likely happened, that you know, populations moved from different parts of the region uh, to various uh, large centers like Kerma. Um, so that, that plays, I think, it, it, to keep that in mm -hmm. mind um, is, is relevant uh, in how uh, migration and the moving of people uh, came to influence um, this ancient civilization. Yeah, maybe let me ask the question. Uh, have you find acceptance and welcoming for the work that you guys have done in terms of those who are engaged in archaeology, but then you have also the Egyptologists mm -hmm. and how they received the work that you guys have put forth. And also in general, maybe in Sudan's academic circles, uh, is there an interest? Is there some uh, consistent work on trying to navigate and narrate this ancient history? I think today um, there's more acceptance to this argument, say, than it was maybe 30, 40 years ago, um, that the idea that uh, ancient Nubia, ancient Kush was um, a civilization that stood on its own, um, that was a rival to Egypt than uh, simply looking at it as a, a mirror of Egypt, a reproduction of ancient Egyptian civilization. Um, I think one of the problems um, in um, the study of history and, and archaeology um, is sometimes the, uh, the social and political um, utilization of, of, of this knowledge um, I think um, overshadows the complexity of history mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, where people are looking for simple answers uh, to prove a point, uh, a political point or a social point. And, and history um, is much more complex. I mean, the, the most common answer in the social sciences is it's complicated. Um, um, uh, but I think I think today we're seeing more of a recognition of, 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 of you know, an acceptance to, to the argument made in the essay um, that this was a genuine local African civilization uh, that should be understood on its own. Um, I think within Sudanese circles, um, that's something that many have been uh, discussed, you know, have, have tried for a long time to show the world. Um, um, but it, it also has, it, you know, has had the, the, this rediscovering of Sudan's ancient history uh, within Sudan um, um, is, is, is relevant uh, uh, in how Sudanese understand themselves, how they understand their identity, um, the, an identity that's a product of uh, many layers of cultures. Um, I, think, I think this is what, what's relevant uh, here in this essay, that um, uh, there is no one pure um, understanding of, of, uh, of self. Well, I'm reminding of your TED talk, so I'm taking you a little bit back when you said your application at UC Davis and you filled all the boxes of exactly. then that was your talk, which is the complexity of, uh, you know, identity in Sudan in terms of putting African, putting uh, uh, Black at the time, Arab, uh, and a whole host of other identities. And then the school put you as an African-American, as far as I remember. Yes, yes. I mean, it was, it, it, AA was the, the first thing probably that the, uh, uh, the, the computer picked up and, and that's how um, uh, that was recognized. But yeah, I mean, identity is complex. Um, it's, you know, it's a product of, of history and of, of many layers. Um, I think rediscovering um, at, at a uh, more mainstream and widespread level, um, this history I think is is relevant to many Sudanese youth today, especially. Matt, do you want to add something yeah. to this? Yeah, uh, yeah. A little, so I think I was thinking back to the the beginning, how archaeologists are um, thinking about um, Sudanese history in comparison to Egypt. And I think, as Ismail said. Um, especially today, a lot of archaeologists are a lot more accepting just because a lot more work has been done. People recognize what they're actually seeing um, and they're, they're more 
open-minded and being willing to change perceptions of that. But kind of the great travesty is that this didn't happen a hundred years ago. Um, and earlier this winter when I was working on the archaeology magazine story on Karma, I was interviewing um, a uh, Egyptologist, a curator of Egyptology at the MFA in Boston. Um, and Boston was where George Reisner, one of the the original archaeologist, the American archaeologist going into Sudan worked for. And I was asking him at the time how a recent ex exhibition on ancient Nubia went, which they held at the end of 2019 into early this year. And he said it was okay. It was, it was a decent turnout. But in comparison to, for example, if King, a King Tut exhibit or an Egyptian exhibit were to arrive, it was no comparison whatsoever. The, uh, the Egyptian exhibits get so much more recognition. Um, and in, in asking why this was, his response was, well, King Tut in ancient Egypt is a household name all around the world. But Nubia or Kush is not. A very small um, community actually recognizes what that is. And so it's very unfortunate that 100 years ago when the world was fascinated in that part of the world that an incorrect perspective kind of diverted um, Nubia and Sudan out of the picture and focused in on, on Egypt. Well, maybe but, that, that raises the big, a bigger question, and uh, feel free to chime yeah. on it, that uh, archaeology, Egyptology, the whole studying of the East uh, went hand in hand with the colonial project. Mm -hmm. So Egypt was a major uh, springboard for colonial design because it was seen as the uh, bridge of access for the Medi Mediterranean to the Red Sea trade for the British. Mm -hmm. So archaeologists' interest in Egypt was a byproduct of the colonial enterprise, and therefore Sudan gets to be left out, which still continues to be part of, I would say, the contemporary dynamics. I mean, I think, I mean, archaeology and, and you know, many of the, the early, early social sciences, anthropology, uh, I think went hand in hand uh, with, with colonial projects. Um, I mean, I mean, but even before getting into that, um, I mean, I think one of one of the challenges to understanding ancient Kush, ancient Nubia, was that uh, Egy Egyptologists uh, depended heavily um, on ancient Egyptian uh, writings um, about uh, ancient Nubia, ancient mm. uh, Kush, um, basically depending on their rivals and their views um, uh, uh, on, on this kingdom. So you know, it it wasn't. Um, um, you know, uh, abnormal to, for, for ancient Egyptians to describe their rivals as vile, mm. you know, the vile Kushi. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, many of the early Egyptologists, that, that was their perception also of, of how they viewed ancient Nubia, ancient Kush. Uh, but, I mean, also many of the early archaeologists came out of, you know, Semitic studies, of biblical studies, um, and uh, they had a particular understanding of the ancient world, uh, the ancient East, uh, uh, um, and 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 how they how they saw that. Uh, you know, it 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 is a um, it, it is a growing pain, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, to come where to where we are uh, at now. I mean, rediscovering mistakes, um, biases uh, in in trying to in, interpret um, th this history. No, definitely for a considerable period of time, the archaeology was attempting to locate the narrative of the Bible rather than actually like making the evidence narrate history on its own. Absolutely. But you wanted to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was thinking I, what is, what's fascinating too, though, is fortunately, I don't think um, we're, we're too late in this and that I think we're, we're actively seeing... Um, well, a revolution in the political sense in, in Sudan, but a revolution in the sense of the world recognizing um, the kingdom of Kush in, in Sudanese history for really was it what it is. And what really fascinated me the, the most during my entire time um, in Sudan was seeing how this entire change in direction is almost being driven by the, the youth in Sudan, as opposed to, for example, outside European or American archaeologists looking inwards. And so it's this amazing cultural revolution that that's having the world look in. Um, and that, that doesn't seem to always happen that way. Um, and that was really fascinating as, as an anthropologist and a photographer and just a person to, to witness for a little bit. Now, I was fascinated with the survey of the city of Necropolis, is it? Uh, 
which has 30,000 uh, burial sites, which is really the mm -hmm. largest burial sites of the ancient world that we know of. Yeah. But it's just like completely erased. There is not a, I, I don't, I have, I don't remember any sustained piece of uh, media, TV, or any coverage of such an, a, a massive, uh, you know, discovery. Yeah, and I think that's, I, I think the, the um, necropolis at Kerma, I think is the one. Um, yeah. And, and that was, I mean, that, that absolutely dumbfounded me. It's not every day, even as a, a professional archaeologist, you go to something of that magnitude, having never heard of it before. Um, and I remember we showed up in our, just our, our truck, um, and, and there it was, and was just absolutely flabbergasted at it. And I think of the large result of that one not being known is it's almost entirely the efforts of two people trying to expose that to the world. And they face, it's Charles Bonnet and Matthew Honegger, both Swiss archaeologists. Mm. And they've done an incredible job, but it's been a massive uphill battle to get recognition for that site. Um, and it still is. And it is, yeah, it's, the lar it's one of the largest um, cemeteries in antiquity anywhere in the world that, that is there. And one out of every 10,000 people in the entire world maybe have ever heard its name. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think with, with Kerma, um, which many, uh, many would, would, would see as the, um, the root or the, or the base of, of you know, the ancient Cushitic uh, civilization, um, you know, much attention is to the pyramids of Nepeta, uh, mm -hmm. of ancient Nepeta, or the pyramids of ancient Meroe. Um, visually, they're, they're more striking. Uh, but it is Kerma that I think um, where there, there is, um, I think, uh, a more interesting story, um, an, an older story uh, of, 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 of how uh, Kush first came to be. Uh, and um, as Matt mentioned, I mean, uh, archaeologists like Charles Bonnet, I mean, who's now 87 and has been going to, to Northern Sudan every year since the early 70s. Um, uh, it's been an uphill, uphill uh, battle with, with, his, with his own colleagues uh, in, in, in the field uh, to prove that this is something uh, distinguished. I, I mean, as a child, do remember reading about Kerma uh, as an Egyptian outpost. Uh, and not as something uh, indigenous, as something uh, 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 a capital in its in its own right. Um, uh, but there's still there's still much to um, um, uncover, I think, in, in, in this story. Um, you know, the Sudanese state since independence has been you know at, at civil wars, uh, instability. Um, I think generally uh, in in many um, global South countries. Archaeology, history, the social sciences are um, are seen as secondary, are looked down upon. Upon you know, uh, state funding into this, um, uh, unless there's uh, unless unless there's a perceived immediate economic benefit, you know, through tourism, uh, there's not adequate research or funds put into these studies. I think that can uh, tell us more about who we are today. No. I in the article that you shared about the, those who are ravaging and taking gold and digging some of these sites, uh, it, you referenced that Sudan is the third largest producers of gold. And if you ask the regular person, uh, they have no idea about really the depth of resources, the richness of the country, but also how to actually undo that imaginary, not only in relations to Sudan, but much of Africa. You know, Africa, I always ins ins insist, it the, is the richest continent in the world, but in our imaginary, as well as influences the type of research, the type of work, uh, it actually constantly constructs this uh, almost double erasure or triple erasures that I, I, was, say, I, I was speaking about. Right, so I mean, gold, um, gold mining in Sudan, I mean, is, is, is ancient. I mean, uh, uh, there's one explanation uh, to, uh, on uh, the root of the, of, of the word Nubia um, as, as the land of gold uh, mm -hmm. that was you know, exported to uh, Egypt. Um, but today, um, you know, gold mining, I think, is a, a mixed blessing. Mm -hmm. Uh, as far as archaeology is concerned, because um, much of that 
uh, gold mining today is, is artisanal, it's independent. It's by young uh, college students who could not find work and just go out in the desert and, and searching for gold. Um, at the same time, uh, coming across artifacts and, and looking to sell those artifacts to buyers. Um, I think there was recently, a, a week ago, a, a, a news piece in, um, in AFP mm -hmm. about gold diggers um, who went to this ancient site uh, where archaeologists had been working and uh, used modern machinery and destroyed the site. Uh, in their search for gold, um, and, and who knows um, if, if there were artifacts that were stolen and, and being sold in, in, in you know, many of these uh, black markets. Um, so, I mean, but yeah, Northern Sudan, uh, you know, Sudan is a country that's rich in, in, in its resources, uh, but, you know, gold, like oil before, uh, is, is a mixed blessing, um, you know, depending on how um, the, the mining and, and the uh, uh, is, is regulated and, and, you know, what protection uh, is offered uh, to, to uh, you know, these ancient heritage sites. Matthew, was it your photograph that had, uh, that was used or somebody else's photograph? No, no, we, we didn't. Um, that happened after, after we had went, um, unfortunately. But it's a, it's a problem we face archaeologically all over the world. And there's a lot of parallels um, to conservation we call it cultural conservation, um, as there is environmental conservation, where you, you um, things that are monetized, for example, environmental resources, or in this case, gold, or cultural resources like artifacts, um, take precedent over preservation. And so that's the same reason you see in a lot of places rainforests disappearing, endangered animals being killed or becoming extinct. And the same goes to certain histories. Entire histories can be wiped away from similar actions of people looking for money. And so another kind of hope, at least a little bit personally with this article was to maybe encourage more people to, to be able to go to Sudan and visit because a lot of times, just like in um, very delicate environmental places like the Amazon, the hope is that if you can encourage more people to go and spend money to, to see what's there, then there might be less of an effort to take that away. But that raises the tension between, let's say, encouraging a form of tourism to yep. these sites mm -hmm. and the tab of destruction, and then also Absolutely. a black market. And I'm sorry for using the term black, but a, a, a side market that actually begins to feed on this mm -hmm. uh, tourism industry that's there. Yeah, so it's a, it's a delicate tightrope. And um, I don't know if, if there is a great way to, um, an obvious way to proceed on that. Um, but yeah, with, with obviously more tourism, you do end up with the potential for, for more issues, but if not, um, you have the potential for sites to become abandoned or resources to be pull, pulled away from them. And so I don't know. <laughs> okay. I have a question that was put on by Sarah, but to talk about the areas changing name throughout history and when did that start uh, being called Sudan and who is it uh, that called it Sudan? And did the people themselves uh, or outsiders call it Sudan? So maybe delve into uh, right. the names and the change in, in history of uh, the use of the name for the country right now that we know is Sudan. So, I mean, the, the country or regions of the country have had different names. Uh, many of the names um, did in fact come from outside. I mean, th th this area around Kerma, uh, this, this um, root of, of, of civilization in the region um, had its own um, local names like Yam and Wawat. Uh, but uh, what became popular were the ancient Egyptian names throughout history, Taseti, land of the bow, uh, being that the uh, inhabitants were skillful archers, uh, Tanhesi, uh, land of copper, um, the very name of the famous um, you know, African-American writer Tanhesi. Um, Kush, uh, there's a debate on, on, on the, you know, on the origin of the, of the name of Kush, uh, you know, it is believed that it is a local name, uh, it's meaning, um, you know, people debate on, um, you know, the meaning of, of Kush. Um, it is uh, a name that was used uh, in, in ancient religious texts. Um, uh, it, it has become associated with blackness, uh, Kush. Um, I think, interestingly, even in, um, 
among Hebrew speakers today, the word kush is used uh, to identify a black person, um, at, at times used as the equivalent of the N-word. Um, um, you have Nubia, um, you know, and, and we're talking about the geographic area between the first cataract on the Nile and uh, basically more or less Khartoum, you know, the southern border, um, you know, shifts, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, how far south or how, how far north uh, do we go, but, but uh, this, this region was also known as Nubia. Uh, and one explanation, at least, is, um, you know, land of gold. Um, um, there were various sultanates, um, you know, kingdoms uh, in this area. The Sultanate of Sinar, which was the first um, um, Islamic um, uh, polity to, to, to rule in the area. Um, a little to the south, up to around the third cataract. But the name Sudan... Um, uh, as we know it today, um, the term comes from the uh, from the Arabic term Bilad Sudan, which was used in the uh, you know the Middle Ages, so to speak, uh, to describe the region between the Atlantic and the Red Sea, um, you know the immediate Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it was a general term, um, uh, maybe the the equivalent of, of, uh, of Af the term Africa uh, at its time, at least for for the Arabs. Um, but the actual applying of the name Sudan to this modern nation state that we call Sudan uh, really comes in the mid 19th century uh, with Egyptian Ottoman rule, the rule of Muhammad Ali Pasha, um, whose military uh, expansion and uh, conquest uh, south of the first cataract all the way to Lake Victoria uh, in what today is uh, Uganda. Uh, and even eastward uh, uh, to, to include um, uh, what today is Eritrea. Um, the, the, the collection of these various regions, Sinar, Nubia, Darfur, Kurdufan, uh, in 1848 with Muhammad Ali Pasha's agreement with the, the Sultan of Istanbul, um, named it uh, Sudan al-Masri, the Egyptian Sudan. Now, Bilad al-Sudan um, would translate into, it's commonly translated into land of the blacks, uh, which is close, um, but I think a more accurate translation is in the plural format. Um, Bilad is plural, uh, uh, lands or countries. Uh, Sudan is a plural of Sud, of blacks, a plural of Aswad. So it's, it's really lands of the black nations uh, so that term uh, was used in the 19th century, uh, Sudan and Muslim. And then, um, you know, after the uh, Mahdi revolution in, in Sudan and the reconquest uh, and the establishment of the um, uh, British Egyptian rule, uh, it became known as the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. To distinguish it from another country that also had the, the name Sudan, uh, the French Sudan, which is modern day Mali. Uh, so in you know, the early 20th century had two countries with the name Sudan. Uh, with Sudanese independence in 56, um, the, the country opted to, to keep the name uh, Sudan. Uh, and that's where you get the name. Of course, you have also in, in 2011, uh, the independence and secession uh, of, of, of South Sudan, uh, which also kept the name. And that's, you know, uh, uh, it, it is known today as South Sudan. Matt, do you have anything to add to this or? Um, maybe I have a, a question that looks at uh, identity, construction of identity as it relates to history and archaeology. Uh, Sudan is a very complex uh, society in terms of its identity. So narrating the Nubian part of the history uh, is also coming in at a time where you have contestation around the identity of the country. Uh, so how do you see your work, uh, both of you, at this current period. And again, you don't need to, uh, if you want to take it in the political direction, that's fine. But, but the whole uh, construction of identity through looking at the past, because one aspect is that the Nubian identity is really not uh, centered, not part of the national project since the uh, independence of the country. And that's at the crust of contestation within Sudan, even as we speak. And I'm not touching even Egypt because that's a whole different question right. as well. Yeah, Ismail, if you want to start and then I can fill in there. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think 
one of the challenges to the uh, Sudanese elite since independence is establishing a narrative that is all inclusive uh, to the country. Um, the dominant narrative uh, had, had always been to uh, describe Sudan as an Arab country. Um, Arabness is, is an element, is, is a part of, 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 of who Sudanese are, uh, but it is not the only element. Um, and I think one of the, uh, one of the problems um, is, is in how we understand history or misunderstand history. Um, the, the, the narrative that uh, generations of Sudanese grew up on is, is that you have this ancient history and then with the fall of a kingdom, um, it ended there. And then you have new migrants that came and, and started something new. Uh, so in this case, uh, the idea that you have this ancient kingdom of Kush uh, with the fall of Meroe around you know, 400 uh, AD, um, you have something new, um, the Christian kingdoms of, of, of Nubia and, and the, the Middle Ages of Sudan, and then with the fall of, of that era uh, and, and the coming of Islam and, and, and migrants um, of, of Arab groups, that's something new. That, of course, I think is an, uh, an incorrect way of uh, understanding uh, the history. And that's, and that's how uh, Sudanese elites, I think, propagated uh, the understanding of, 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 of Sudanese identity. Um, I, I believe that uh, me, most of the people that make up what today is um, Sudan are the very same people um, that uh, were there for centuries. Uh, yes, there might have been newcomers, um, but uh, people just don't suddenly disappear from, from the map. Um, Arabness um, uh, in Sudan, I think is, is better understood under the uh, understanding of Arabization rather than an ethnic Arab um, complete takeover of, of lands. People intermarried, intermixed, adopted new cultures. Um, in, in the Middle Ages, uh, when we think of, 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 of you know, the, the beginning of the process of Arabization of Sudan, um, uh, you know, uh, claiming to be an Arab in the 1500s, um, uh, I like to joke, uh, is, is, is something like having a U.S. passport today. Um, it gave you protection, it gave you social status, uh, but in fact, you know, many of those people are this very same people that were there for centuries. Um, I think any DNA analysis of, 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 of the people that make up, um, you know, most of what today is central and northern Sudan, I think we'll, we'll find uh, multiple uh, roots. Um, you know, ethnic, um, the idea of ethnic purity, uh, which I think unfortunately Sudanese political elites for, for decades um, saw the country, um, um, I think is, 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 uh, is, is, is simply false. Um, 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 the, the, the people are a product of multiple layers of, 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 of cultures that um, that went through different processes that make the unique uh, character that is and the unique features, the unique culture of what today uh, Sudan is. Uh, there have been attempts uh, throughout modern Sudanese history to, uh, to uh, build on this, uh, to, to uh, re, uh, um, you know, create a new understanding. You know, in the 60s, you had literary movements like al uh, Rabo Sahra, the, you know, the forest and the desert, understanding Sudan in terms of its Africanness and its Arabness. Um, Sudanawiya, Sudanism, um, you know, the belonging to this modern nation, date, uh, nation state of, of Sudan. I think today, um, um, I think as, as a, a new generation, and especially after the revolution of 2019, uh, uh, has, has come to a, a greater appreciation of, of this diverse background. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's how um, understanding, say, ancient Kush, I think can contribute uh, to, to uh, many uh, young Sudanese today in understanding uh, these various elements uh, that make up who they are. Matt, do you have... Well, actually, I have a question for Ishmael. Um, 
And so um, when we were traveling in Sudan or even following the, the progress of the revolution last year, something that really interested and fascinated me was the attachment that a lot of the, the Sudanese youth, or at least the ones that were getting media attention, um, had towards ancient Nubia. Even some of the most award-winning photographs that came out of the, the revolution were of people dressed up as, as the Kandaka, the, the Kushite queens, chanting slogans um, relating to, to Harka, the ancient kings of Kush, and the street art all over Khartoum now. Um, so many of them display um, images of the revolution right next to scenes of um, the pyramids in ancient Nubia. And, and something I didn't gather, because during my time there, we only traveled in, in Nubia. And so I didn't know if you were to go somewhere else in the country, say Darfur or Kassala, would, would those communities share a similar attachment or sentiment towards the, this kind of revival of ancient Sudanese history, or is there, is there more of a disconnect from it? I mean, I think that's a good question. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a debate, uh, especially online and in, in over the last year. Um, um, I do think that you know, the people of, of northern and central Sudan would definitely feel a, a stronger attachment to that ancient uh, history, say uh, people from, uh, from um, other provinces, Darfur, the Nuba Mountains, or not necessarily the Nuba Mountains, but, but maybe Darfur or the east. Um, but I, I, I do think uh, there, there's still research to be done in, mm -hmm. in, in this. Um, um, I, I don't think that the final uh, say on the extent of um, the reach of, of the ancient uh, kingdom of Kush uh, into this, uh, into what makes up to what we call today Sudan is, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the final word is, is there. I mean, you take the Nuba Mountains. I mean, uh, um, the Nuba Mountains, which is a, uh, um, today uh, would be South, a southern province of the Republic of Sudan, not to be confused with the Republic of South Sudan. Mm. Uh, but um, there are um, clear cultural links of, of, of the people of the Nububa Mountains linguistically, uh, culturally, um, to ancient uh, Kush and ancient Nubia, uh, or even in the consciousness of, of, of many of them. Mm -hmm. Of, of, no. of people of the Nuba Mountains, uh, there are there is some evidence that um, dialects of of, of, of Nubian uh, languages uh, were spoken in, in places like Darfur. Uh, that may have been uh, that may be today extinct, but but uh, mm -hmm. there is evidence that some of that uh, did ex exist. So um, I mean, uh, on your point, I, I do think that maybe the people of Northern and Central Sudan uh, feel a, a greater attachment to this, mm -hmm. and especially to be even more specific, those who still speak Nubian today, um, the people between the third cataract and the first cataract. Um, uh, but but I, I, I do think the, the, the issue um, comes to um, understanding history as history. Uh, and, and um, you know, for, uh, and instead of the uh, the, the uh, politicization of, of of certain understandings of history, um, you know, someone from from the area of of, of Shendi next to ancient Merawi, uh, who today speaks Arabic, uh, may or may not be conscious of the fact that his ancestors probably spoke uh, Merawitic or Nubian. Um, because of that narrative of that mm -hmm. national narrative of, of you know of, of 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 that that doesn't look into history as history that does that you know that where, where social status where uh uh political opportunism is 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 attached to uh, a certain understanding of history um i think there's more still uh, much more research that still needs to be done but but uh, but it is understandable i mean if you if you're from an area where you see the pyramids. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, you're, you're definitely gonna have a stronger attachment to that mm -hmm. uh, than maybe someone who, who doesn't. But I, I, I'm of the opinion that we, you know, we, still, we still don't know. Uh, that, that is not to say that um, in, in, in when we look at cultural and educational policies in, in Sudan today is to center an understanding of what it is to be Sudan on that history alone. Um, I think I think the issue comes to understanding that you know this is a big country, this is a diverse country. There are links and, and relations, but there are also many histories.
Uh, I think Talib uh, Abdul Rashid has a good question that I want to put. Uh, he says, can you speak to the theory that uh, of the Nile Valley civilization originating in the south and spreading northward uh, from the upper to lower Nile? Uh, so again, this will alter our perspective of actually how to view the civilization of the Nile Valley in its totality. Sorry, I was looking for the question. Was the question written it out? Was, in the... It was in the question and answer. Okay, I see. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think Ishmael hit on this point very early on. Um, and I think looking back into time, looking almost into the Paleolithic, <laughs> the dawn of what we call modern day humans, mm -hmm. um, I think as, as more people begin to explore Sudan, and I think in the following years, it's going to hopefully be a lot easier for archaeologists to do that in the southern parts of the country. Um, we often hear as places like Kenya or Ethiopia as being the, the cradle of civilization. But I think as more work is done, um, we, will, we will see that flow into Sudan as well, and that will be part of the epicenter. But fast forward a million years into what we're talking about with the Egyptians and the Kushites. Um, yeah, I think it, based on what Charles Bonnet has found at Kerma, um, uh, it, it very well may be possible of kind of a, a northern movement from the south. Um, that's what the, these groups, the C groups, the B groups and the A groups, and there's, there's many more cultural groups at Kerma that um, the archaeologists haven't identified who they are yet, but a lot of the theories place them coming from further south in Africa and coming northward. Um, and so I think that eventually, Kush and Egypt did become very intertwined culturally and ethnically. But at the very beginning, back at the start of Kerma, I think there's a lot more ties potentially to, to the South. Uh, I, mean, I, I think but, there's, there's, there's a lot, you know, um, uh, there's much more research that needs to be done uh, on, on this. Uh, but, but I think um, it is at least acceptable that, that this is a possibility. Uh, and, and, and next to the, you know, the, the, um, the facts that, you know, many of the uh, early humans that we know of uh, uh, are from this, you know, great Rift Valley uh, region of Kenya and Ethiopia and, and, and possibly into Sudan, um, is to look at what, even how the ancient Egyptians looked at a place like Jebel al-Barqal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Jebel al um, um for, for the ancient Egyptians was, was the, the source of creation. Um, the, uh, you know, there's a temple in, in this area next to the uh, ancient town of Nepeta uh, that was uh, highly revered by, by the ancient Egyptians. Um, now, whether that uh, was a, uh, you know, a political uh, gesture of, of the ancient Egyptians at the time, whether it was rooted in some understanding, ancient Egyptian understanding of who they were and where they came from, um, I, I think that that's that's you know uh, th th there could be debate there. Uh, but I, I but yeah, I think there there's there's uh, the, the idea in itself. Um, I think uh, there there's there's greater acceptance today um, to to venture into that kind of research. Uh, there's a question about pre-Arabic influence in North Africa. Uh, what were the cultural and ethnic similarities of ancient Egyptians and ancient Nubians? Uh, pre-Arabic I mean, influence. Right. I mean, I mean, if you want to um, go by the uh, religious explanation of, 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 of who the people of Kush and the ancient Egyptians as you know, the, 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 the descendants of, of, uh, of Ham, uh, Mizraim being the, the, you know, the ancestor of uh, the ancient Egyptians. And, and that's where the word Mizra or Mis uh, come from both in Arabic and Hebrew. Kush being the brother of Mizra, being the, also a brother of, of Canaan or the Canaanites. Um, I mean, that's one way of, of looking at it. Uh, I mean, there are also other explanations, but, we, we, but there, uh, definitely, um, you know, uh, cultural and geographic links between the ancient people of Nubia and, and, and the ancient Egyptians, uh, if, uh, if for nothing else, uh, just geography uh, being right next to each other. Anything from you, Matt, on that? Or? No, I think I was, I was thinking along those exact same lines um, in that, I mean, archaeologically, it, it gets very tricky to differentiate things like 
self-identification, self-identity in, in the ancient world. And so we can only look at the material record, the, the artifacts and architecture that we find and um, the similarities between what you see in Sudan and Egypt are uh, very close. But unfortunately the archeology span doesn't have the resolution to, to really um, differentiate how the, the cultures were separate. But um, as, and I think that's part of the reason why it took unfortunately the world a lot longer than other places to maybe recognize that. I mean, for one, they weren't, probably weren't ready to do anyways, but the, the material record was vastly similar between um, the, the two kingdoms, the two civilizations, just from being geographically close. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's, it's one of the shortcomings of archeology span on how to, how to dive into that on a personal level. Well, we have a question from an old friend, Elias Rashmawi from UC Davis. Uh, he says, archaeology and anthropology typically consider the colonized as subjects of discovery. And do you think that there needs to be a revision in social theory uh, to better understand history of civilizations? Uh, for example, the use of the term prehistoric should be removed from social texts as it carries it a notion that history begins with the West or often is, begins with the written Right, and therefore uh, uh, tends to prejudice uh, on the history, culture, traditions of those who both oral or what we call indigenous population. So, your thoughts on? Yeah, on I, I, I agree one hundred percent. And from a um, a perspective having to deal with this or having to think about it very carefully from working all over the world. Um, I think there absolutely needs to be a better term. And uh, uh, most, so to give a little background on myself, the vast majority of my work is in um, the United States in North America. And we work closely with tribes throughout the Rocky Mountain West, the, the Shoshone, the Crow, mm -hmm. the East Shoshone, the Bannock. Um, and we often, we, we work with the, a lot of times the elders of these tribes and work with them. How do we, how do we talk about um, your history? And from what we've noticed here is there's quite a bit of diversity in a, a preference and terms that are used. Um, certain tribes actually prefer um, prehistoric over ancient, others mm -hmm. prefer ancient over prehistoric and others prefer none of that whatsoever. Um, and so I think that the idea of prehistoric, meaning prehistory has a, a vastly colonial sense to it. Um, and it, it, it's hard, it's a, it's a culture that's very embedded um, and it, it's one that probably should be changed, but it might be one that has to be changed um, on a different scale in different places around the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of that is um, happening at, and, and is in the process. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, many of the archeologists that I interviewed for this essay, um, um, I, you know, highly praised some of the local archeologists uh, that they had worked with uh, mm -hmm. in, um, presenting understandings of their findings that they may have not been aware of, that they may have had uh, preconceived notions of. Uh, I mean, if you want to use the, a term like decolonizing or archaeology, I think that that is something, uh, you, know, uh, you know, long gone are the days of the Indiana Jones understanding of, 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 of archaeology, I think. Um, uh, and uh, anthropology, I think, uh, you know, um, the social sciences at large, um, we're seeing more of a, a local contributions uh, and understandings that um, provide a, bit, a better understanding of, of, of the research. Okay. We have another question from uh, uh, Katie Dickinson from the PSR. So welcome and good to have you with us. She said, she said we studied an interesting article last year uh, can a Kushite change his skin? Kushite, Racial Othering, and the Hebrew Bible, 2006, by Rodney S. Sadler, Jr. Have you heard of it? What do you think? I have not heard of it, but I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, a, Ku a Kushite can't change his skin uh, seems derogatory. <laughs> mm. uh, but, but, uh, but, but I mean, as I mentioned earlier... So I mean, can, she said, can a Kushite change his skin? That's... Right, right. I mean, it, it, it seems to be to have a negative uh, 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 connotation. I mean, but, but, yeah, connotation. But I mean, as I mentioned, um, even uh, t today, uh, the, the term kush or kushi um, is, is used uh, uh, in Hebrew uh, uh, in a derogatory word. 
way. Uh, you know, it, it's the equivalent of the N-word. Um, um, but I mean, I'm not familiar with the article uh, per se. Um, you know, I would have to see that to, to give a better, uh, more elaborate answer. Matt, are you aware of the article? No, or? I'm not, unfortunately. Okay, so well, maybe Katie, you could uh, just give us a couple of points while we look at another question. I think Hind Mekki was with us a minute ago. She said, what kind of investment, monetary, academic, or otherwise, is the government of Sudan dedicating to preserving these sites, protecting them from looters and promoting tourism there? Which again, tourism is very problematic, but what, what's the investment? Not enough. <laughs> I, th I think I think that's really uh, you know the best. Is there answer. is there a ministry of uh, antiquities like what we see in Egypt? Uh, what a type of investment that's. Uh, that's the, the, there? there is a ministry of. Um, I think the 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 a, the antiquities antiquities agency um, I think is is a part of the uh, of, of of the ministry of, of of culture, but I mean it it definitely does not have enough funding. Mm -hmm. uh, there are not enough Sudanese uh, archaeologists. Um, there are some. Uh, I, you know, many of the, uh, um, you know, the the early archae Sudanese archaeologists um, come in the late '60s and early '70s. Uh, much of the uh, local interest in archaeology really came uh, in the '60s with the uh, construction of the Aswan High Dam. Mm -hmm. uh, Nasser and, and the UNESCO um, global campaign to rescue ancient Nubia. Uh, and that's where you uh, see um, Sudanese getting into archaeology. Um, you know, uh, interesting, interestingly, today, um, uh, one of the uh, ministers of the, uh, this transitional government, um, uh, a uh, woman, uh, was one of the first archaeologists uh, and first women uh, to, to get involved in archaeology, uh, but, but not enough funding, I think, from the state. Um, and this goes back to the idea that uh, many states, and not, not just Sudan, but I think in the global south, I mean, unless there was a, an economic, uh, uh, an economic interest that was seen uh, linked to archaeology, um, uh, not, not enough funding has been put into archaeology. Uh, there, there was a few years ago um, some funding uh, from the state of Qatar uh, to support archaeology in, in Sudan. Um, that has, I think, ended, la ended last year or this year. I think it's, it's going to revive, I think, in the next year or so is what I've, what I've heard. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, it's dependent on foreign investment, uh, you know, I think that's is also one of the challenges and, you know, what kind of ties come with along with foreign investment. Uh, but there's, there needs to be more investment from the state uh, in terms of actual archaeology, in terms of education, uh, establishing a new generation of Sudanese archaeologists um, that can look deeper into this. Mm -hmm. I actually completely uh, forgot, I'm sorry, but I should have started the discussion by actually focusing on the current floods that Sudan is facing and actually calling both for you to really reflect upon it and or ask people who can support to find ways to extend their support for the uh, needs that are going to be emerging as a result of the massive floods. So I was just excited to get into a conversation mm -hmm. about the articles that I completely forgot because I wanted to start with this. Uh, so Smail, maybe if you want to uh, speak a little bit and also maybe direct some people, if you know, if not, I'll make sure uh, to put for, on Facebook and other places uh, ways for people that could extend support and help. Right. I mean, this has been a very uh, difficult year and a half in Sudan um, with the revolution, uh, with the pains of transition, um, the negotiations for peace with rebel movements, uh, the pandemic, uh, and now the floods. Um, you know, this year we, we saw exceptionally, um, you know, high and uh, rainfall in the Ethiopian highlands that have flooded uh, the, the Blue Nile and, and the River Nile. Um, uh, houses of people, you know, thousands of people have been displaced. Uh, over a hundred people have been killed. Um, and, you know, just today, I mean, just a few, couple hours ago, um, there was a news piece about um, 
you know, the, uh, the high waters of the Nile uh, near um, the, royal, the ancient royal city of Meroe, uh, threatening uh, that, that ancient site. Um, so um, there is, um, you know, this is, uh, this, this, these natural disasters, uh, you know, um, have an impact, of course, on people's lives and, and the ancient history. Uh, but I think also it, it's important to keep in mind how this is also connected to uh, climate change. Uh, Sudan is probably one of the uh, top countries in the world that, that uh, is uh, impacted negatively by climate change. Um, I was in Sudan in 2013 with the floods of 2013. Um, you know, the pattern is that you know, during the rainy season, which starts in mid-July to mid-October, um, uh, usually um, with climate change, you see a delay um, in, in, in when the rain starts, but when it, when it pours, it pours. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing this, this year also. Um, um, the, 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 we, we haven't seen levels this high of the Nile in a hundred years. Um, and um, it is just, it, it's, it's adding to the misery of, of the people um, with the pandemic and uh, with, the, with the pains uh, of transition. Um, in, in 2013, um, Sudanese youth revived a, a tradition um, known as nefir. Mm. It's an Arabic word, uh, you know, the, um, the, a call to action. Um, and uh, and um, I know that a group uh, today um, is, is collecting don donations online. Uh, nefir aid, um, I can send you the link uh, to that group that is seeking to uh, distribute aid uh, to the people that have been affected by the floods. By all means, so if I'll make sure to put it on my Facebook and share it. And I know other, other groups also are coming to, out to help, uh, but it's a really a very pressing need, uh, especially at a time where we have a global pandemic, uh, a crisis like what's happening in Sudan, you have Sudan not covered in general normal circumstances that adds to lack of attention at this particular time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Sarah say, thank you so much for your insight. I also want to ask what advice would you uh, advise both of you have for young historians, archeologists, journalists uh, who want to get involved in researching Sudan's history at a deeper level. So a young, uh, you know, journalist, scholar, photographer, archeologist, What's your advice? Yeah, um, well, I think my, my best advice, if you haven't already, is to go there. Um, and, and that analogy, um, there's um, plenty of projects um, with American, European, and Sudanese projects excavating every year. Um, well, not this year, but most every year in, in Sudan. And if you're a student, oftentimes they take volunteers. You don't have to be part of their university, but um, archaeology going on projects and, and volunteering studying as a student is really what got me into this in the first place and what's led me on an incredible journey around the world to a variety of unexpected places and eventually Sudan um, and it, sometimes just going there seems like the hardest step but archaeology is a, a fantastic way to to do that and to to really get immersed into the country and um, hopefully turn to turn to love it. I mean, I mean, to add to that, I mean, I think it starts with um, looking into the research that has been, been done on this, uh, the books. Um, I mean, one uh, documentary that, that played a uh, pivotal role in my own life uh, was uh, the late Basil Davidson's um, Africa, uh, that, uh, 1984. That was one of the first um, documentaries that portrayed Africa in a different light. Uh, Basil Davidson was the British historian journalist uh, who challenged um, many of, of the uh, common uh, perceptions uh, in the West of, of African history. Um, he, that, that very first episode, um, different but equal, uh, was the very first time that I saw the pyramids of Sudan, um, it, it, you know, on a, on a TV screen. Um, I think uh, looking into that research, uh, those documentaries, those, those books, um, learning the language or the languages of, of, of Sudan, be it Arabic, be it Nubian, uh, be, be it whatever uh, 
um, the region that a, a person might be interested in research, uh, researching, um, I, I think um, I mean, would be a very first good step. And, and going there today is much easier than it was um, uh, before the revolution. Um, I mean, just seeing those sites, uh, ancient Medawi, ancient Nefeta, um, I, I think have a uh, profound impact on anyone. Uh, oh, and before, no, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Before I forget real quick, I was thinking back to the previous question um, on, on funding and hopefully preserving more sites there. Um, the, one of the, the whole reason I found out or the whole reason I began pursuing this project in the first place was through a colleague who was at Johns Hopkins University. And um, there's a professor, Doug Comer there, who's been just began a collaboration with the Ministry of Culture to design a long-term sustainable tourism funding and conservation program for the archaeology of Sudan. Um, and his past work has been, for example, Petra in Jordan or Machu Picchu in Peru, um, and has been very successful. And they recently made a new uh, museum at Marawe and are now going to Jebel Barkal to completely design an, a new uh, museum there and try to get lots of external funding from other places. And so while it's been a, a very difficult um, journey in the past, hopefully there's a, a brighter future ahead in that regard. Uh, Talab Abdul Rashid is asking the question, looking to Matt's excellent translation of Bilad of Sudan as land of the black nations, and Ismail's reference to the modern nation states of Kenya and Ethiopia, is it reasonable to view ancient Ethiopia and Kush as essentially the same vast kingdom by different names? Um, not necessarily. Um at least from, from the interviews that I've, uh, I mean, I asked uh, very similar questions from some of the archeologists that I, I interviewed for this essay on, on, the, on the term Ethiopia. Um, um, Ethiopia was a term that the Greeks used um, for the land south of Egypt. Um, and the immediate, most immediate land of course was, was, um, uh, was, was what, what today is uh, Northern Sudan or ancient Kush or ancient Nubia. Um, Modern day Ethiopia um, uh, adopted the name uh, at a later stage. Um, but of course, you know, Ethiopia, uh, the country Ethiopia has its own ancient history, you know, the kingdom of, of Aksum, uh, which was a rival uh, to Meroe. Now these, these, these kingdoms, these polities, of course, had their links, uh, trade uh, between themselves, uh, Military rivalry, uh, but I'm 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 uh, but I think there there's there still needs to be more research on what kind you know exactly what kind of relations that they may have had uh, among themselves. Um, you know, one of the the common understandings um, uh, on, on the history of ancient Medawi that it was um, sacked by King Arizana uh, of Aksum. Uh, that, that was for a very long time, uh, the understanding uh, of how the ancient, uh, uh, of how Kush, uh, the civilization of Kush ended. But today, I think archaeologists are revisiting that, that, um, that, that theory, um, and it, so it's still not clear. I, I think there's just still much more, to, much more research that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but these places, I mean, they were neighbors, they, there was trade between among themselves, I mean, it, 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 there were definitely relationships. Uh, Matt, do you have something to want to say? No, I think I think Ishmael said it perfectly. I mean, it, it's tricky um, archaeologically to to look again at how people identify themselves, and so as as um, ancient literary sources look at that whole area as um, the Ethiopians, I think as Ishmael said, there there were many individual kingdoms or city states within them that identified separately and, and were quite different. They were all interrelated. They were all connected. Um, the way we try to describe this in class sometimes is by looking at a state like California, for example, where sure, it's all California, but the people who live in Los Angeles view themselves very differently and have very different lives than the people who live in Sacramento or um, San Diego. And so I think it's, it's kind of an analogy to how a lot of these um, kingdoms were interrelated in, in North Africa, that they were sure they were all under a general sphere. They all um, were related to one another, but individually they were um, very different as well. Yeah. My last question that I, maybe I want you to, to think aloud with me, 
uh, we have the, the uh, Black Lives Movement that is taking place. We have a shift or attempt to try to get a new ethnic studies curriculum in schools and colleges to re-examine our history here in the US. Uh, but with it, how do you see both of your work of also thinking of Africa as it relates to the experience of black Americans and rethinking of the long history. And again, this is thinking out loud uh, and to see where do you see your, your work uh, as it narrates an aspect of history that is outside of uh, the current curriculum, whether three K through 12 or at the university level. Either one of you. I, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, what, what got me interested uh, into this was not finding myself in the, you know, as a, as a child in the history books that I studied, uh, whether here in the United States or in the Middle East. Um, and, and that's what pushed me to, to study and acquire as many books and go to the museums in, in Sudan uh, uh, and, and to learn about my own history. Um, I mean, what I hope is that uh, an essay like this, um, uh, whether the Smithsonian essay or Matt's uh, Archaeology mag Magazine essay, um, I think, uh, you know, at this moment in history, uh, spark greater interest in understanding the place of uh, ancient Africa in, in the classical word, world, so to speak, or the ancient world. Um, um, finding yourself in, in, in those books at a young age, I think it just gives you a different perspective of who you are and your place uh, well, within, within global civilization. Yeah, I think telling, telling the story of um, histories that have been marginalized, pushed off to the side, is very difficult to do. And oftentimes it's like trying to cram an incredible story through a door that's open that much. But with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I think that door has opened quite a bit. And so it's a, it's a really fantastic point in time, point in history to be exposing these stories because I think they're gonna gain a lot more traction and hopefully not be on the margins anymore, but actually become part of the core history. Um, and personally, I, I, I would absolutely love to see that happen with um, North African history, but also other marginalized narratives as well. I think this is the perfect time for those stories to get out there, for them to be told and for people who are aware of them to, to really take advantage of this, um, this energy that is out there in the world because it, it built off of something negative, but it has the potential to be incredibly positive. And for those of us who, who have skill sets to do something about that, I think it's a, a great time to do it and it'll hopefully last. And, and, and if I can quickly point out, I mean, uh, linking to ancient Nubia, ancient Kush um, has always been a part of um, the African-American uh, cultural consciousness. I mean, you have hip hop groups like Brand Nubian, uh, the French group Les Nubians, um, you know, um, terms like uh, My Nubian Queen. Um, there, there's always been this uh, connection in black consciousness to um, ancient Nubia and ancient Kush. And um, at this moment in history, I think this is a, a, an opportunity to uh, emphasize that even more. Yeah. Uh, what's your next project, if you have any plans, uh, whether in this field or other fields? So what, what do you have on your agenda? There are a lot of projects. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would definitely, I mean, in terms of related to this field, would definitely would like to explore um, uh, the Christian era of, of Sudan. Um, I think that also is a, um, a, a, a period of Sudanese history, of, of Christian history globally, that um, is not um, understood well, even though it, it had produced some of the most amazing um, murals um, you know, the, the murals of the Church of Faras uh, of, of, uh, that, are, that are in the National Museum in Sudan and also in the uh, museum in Warsaw, Poland. Um, um, you know, there, there, there are a few books that we, you know, in, in English or even in Arabic or Italian that discuss this. So uh, I'm hoping to maybe uh, do more research on this and, and uh, shed light on it, but, but there, you know, this, this, I think, like I said, this is a, a moment in history where 
there is greater acceptance uh, to understanding or, or at least to be curious of these marginalized histories. Um, I'm, I'm off my next project actually next week um, to the deserts of Utah mm. uh, to look at um, Chinese uh, railroad worker camps because similar to the story of Kush, the, the history of Chinese railroad workers from who built the railroad from Sacramento to Promontory Point has been largely erased. There's, there's very little information about it. And even the, the descendant communities here don't yeah. have um, any stories about that. And so there's a team of archeologists working with the, the descendants of the workers to try to excavate sites and retell these lost histories. And so I'm gonna go, um, go cover that and hopefully um, tell, it, tell a similar story. We'll see what happens. I'll be interested if you have, once you get that, because one section of my course in the spring, I do actually cover the Chinese American experience. Oh, interesting. And I do cover some of the violence that was committed mm -hmm. against Chinese in Wyoming, in yep. Colorado, in uh, Utah. So it's really a fascinating history, especially connected to the railroad. Yeah, it'll be interesting, interesting to see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I forgot to ask a question from Isra in here. We off, she said, we often quote European scholars on issues relating to Nubia. When will and have they, Sudanese scholars, decolonize the discipline? And is it a priority today? Maybe you could offer some of the uh, Sudanese scholars and I could actually add it to the post on Facebook or YouTube later on if you have some of the uh, Sudanese archaeologists and maybe historians uh, that work on this topic. Right. I mean, there, there are a number of, of Sudanese archaeologists. Um, I think one of one of the the challenges um, that they face, of course, is funding, um, support from the state, um, uh, even to study the discipline. I mean, uh, you know, you, you where you know um, uh, the study of archaeology uh, socially is, is is looked down upon, or uh, but but I mean, speaking to some of them, um, um, I think there's there's greater hope today that uh, especially after the revolution and, and, and then and there's greater interest in um, Sudan's ancient history that uh, we might see hopefully a, a new generation of, of Sudanese archaeologists. Uh, but there are a number of, of, of archaeologists. Um, I can send a, a list of names that I know of, of people who have, I've uh, have, uh, have worked with, uh, interviewed in the past uh, that can uh, uh, I mean, th there is, I mean, as one archaeologist that I interviewed for the piece, Mutasab uh, Sarayrun, told me that um, um, it, it, it's, it, it's a relationship between um, archaeologists coming from the West who have the expertise, who have the funding, uh, and between the lo local knowledge and how to merge uh, both together uh, for, for for better research and for a better outcome, um, and, and hopefully, um, in, you know, in years to uh, the coming years, that we'll see um, uh, archaeology um, greater, greater established in Sudan, um, um, you know, for the benefit of research. No, I think that's true. I mean, unfortunately, even in, in places where economies are, are doing quite well, archaeology tends to be very low uh, priority for places where it can get funding. And so in countries where it's more difficult to get funding, um, as Ismail said, it, it's just very hard to do. Um, but the, the variety of sites we visited when we were there, um, each one had more than one or several local Sudanese archaeologists working on the sites. And they're um, publishing and getting the information out there, but this is a whole separate topic. But unfortunately, the way so much academic literature um, doesn't get out there into the world, there is there's brilliant writing coming out of, of Sudan by Sudanese archaeologists, but sometimes it's just hard to hard to find or hard to get a hold of. And also the language barrier sometimes right. it's written yeah. Arabic, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, that's just a major major challenge whether you actually have access to their work. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. So really, this was an enriching uh, conversation, uh, uh, delving into some topics that uh, are often not discussed. I recommend for people I put on the chat, uh, both articles, uh, Matt's article and Smile's article, please access them, uh, but more importantly, share them, uh, because that's how we could energize and get people interested in subjects and topics 
uh, that are not there. So I say these days, uh, if a tree fall in the forest and nobody hears it or sees it, does it really fall? Today, if it's not on the internet, if it's not on YouTube, if it's not on Instagram, on Twitter, then it really did not happen. So part of our responsibility collectively as co-producers of knowledge and participants in making known that which is not addressed, I encourage you all to share this information to make it uh, accessible to people. And if you happen to be a person who teaches, and I know some of our audience are in universities and colleges, uh, make sure to actually put it on part of your reading. Uh, that's how you make it actually, you make the piece having a long uh, shelf life. Uh, because if we don't do that again, uh, every day we're at, there's an avalanche of new material. So this is how also to make sure that some of these quality pieces, and I see both of these are quality pieces that reorient and give us a view on an aspect of history and aspect of culture and society that is not seen. And again, as Ismail and Matt said, if you are able to visit, uh, but also make sure to uh, not to be one of those tourists that it does not have a respect and attention to both preserving and making sure uh, that whatever you visit is maintained for the future, uh, civil, future societies and future uh, generation. So both Smail and Matt, thank you very much for this rich conversation and wish you and all your families the best and stay safe. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. You're welcome. Take care.